ancient looking live oak trees draped in the gray tresses of Spanish moss. This place called to me. It actually called to me. I heard a voice that said, this is where you belong. I remember looking around the car for the source of the voice. There was no one there other than my husband. He had heard it too. I suppose the voice should not have surprised me, considering the many spirits of my ancestors that seemed to hang around this island. Black folks who lived and worked as slaves on rice and cotton plantations that sustained the economy and culture of this region for 200 years. What I had heard as I passed the salt marshes alive with egrets and marsh hares, past ruins of slave cabins and cotton barns, was the call of home. You belong here, the voice said. One of those Southerners who didn't realize how Southern I was until I left the South. A few years back, my husband and I moved to Maryland for a little while. When I talk about that now, people chuckle and go, Maryland? Shoot, you hardly left the South. I chuckle and say, it was far enough. That first winter of living in the North, the Chesapeake froze solid. Froze solid. They had to bring in icebreakers to get the commerce moving again. I remember thinking, girl, you better get your butt back home. You could die up here. In the north, I found myself longing for home, for the south. I dreamed of taking long car trips down roads of hard-packed red Georgia clay. I ached for a southern winter, one in which I could run outside in just a sweater to retrieve the last of the long red hot peppers still growing in the yard. I longed to spy a couple of maverick sulfur butterflies out of season flitting along in front of me. I yearned for a Georgia tomato. What I was was a southerner yearning for home. When I talk about my southerness now, it draws some odd reactions. It makes some people downright uncomfortable. I mean the very idea of a black person. An African-American woman over the age of 35 going on and on about the South and her place in it. Doesn't she know history? I can hear these people thinking, for goodness sakes, the Confederate symbol is still flying high on Georgia's own flag over the state capitol in Atlanta. She's a writer. It's almost embarrassing. As if a black person does not belong in the South, does not belong to the South, I found there was nowhere else I did belong. Where you belong is not always where you are wanted. I know the history of this place. My father's people farmed land right up the road in Wrightsville, Georgia. Whenever I look at the pine trees around my house, I always think of my father's Uncle Sunshine resting his bony mule in the hot shade of a tall Georgia pine. And I never crossed a railroad track without thinking of my father's father, Frank McElroy, and his best friend, Mr. Charlie Carroll, and their years of working on the Macon, Dublin, Savannah line. I can't go back no more about 60 or 70 years. Is that all, Mrs. Buck? That's as I can go back. <laughs> now I live down a bumpy old dirt road from Gloucester Buchanan, Mr. Buck, whose people, he tells me, are not only related to Lena Horne's people, but also come from up around my hometown of Macon. We're almost related, he says with a smile. If you plant greens, if they're close to the woods, they have a, a tendency to have a wild taste to it, then it's better. They I get told real somebody. Flavor. Now, I told somebody know, you told me that. A lot of people don't know that, but I experienced this right here on this place. Some mornings I wake to find that Mr. Buck has left us some offering from his garden on our doorstep. And they're, they're good for you, too. You should eat greens at least once a week. It's good for your brains, too. Oh, it's the green thing? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you, you, yeah. Take care of the greens. you take care of the greens early in yeah. the week, and the fish takes yeah. care of the yeah. brain food later that's, on. That's right. Of course I know the history of this place. I am its history. Here in the South, history is personal. Slavery is personal. It's not a mere economic, sociological system. It's more a family history. The Shishi gift shop around the corner was built as a slave cabin. But to me, it's not a mere slave cabin. In the first half of this century, it was the home of Floyd White and his family. Mrs. Palmer down the street told me she used to play with her best little girlfriend, Mr. White's daughter, Eliza, in the sandy yard near the garden. The Island Lighthouse was built by black labor and with black expertise, something that had been left out of local history for a hundred years. 
My husband, Janae, and I directed the museum to this photograph taken in 1871 that shows who truly built and rebuilt the island's famous lighthouse and keeper's cottage. The estuaries and creeks remind me of slave ships sneaking human cargo onto these shores and also of the boisterous good times I've had fishing and crabbing on Jones Creek. Stand up under the oak tree and talk and play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lord have to come and whistle for a lot of <laughs> When I go to the post office, the black women who used to ride the Emmeline Ferry to and from grammar school come over to tell me about their granddaughters, <laughs> some of whom even attend my alma mater, Spelman no. College in Atlanta. Well, good luck to you. Hey, well, how at me before you. you go. You're going to be, you. be coming back and forth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. My mama says, her cousin Alice used to always say, there's enough ways in this world for everybody to have one of her own. I'm just happy my way finally led me back south. I'm home. <laughs>